The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Department of State Division of Historical Resources and the State of Florida and by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. It's also made possible by... Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by Florida's Space Coast Office of Tourism, representing destinations from Titusville to Cocoa Beach to Melbourne Beach. The Space Coast has a diverse 72 miles of beach, including surf towns and sea turtle nests. We have inspiring attractions, including the Kennedy Space Center, Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, and the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. More information is available at www.visitspacecoast.com. Florida history and culture from the Ice Age to the Space Age is on display at the Brevard Museum of History and Natural Science, located at 2201 Michigan Avenue in Cocoa. The museum has nature trails through 20 acres of three Florida ecosystems. The People of Windover exhibition features information about Florida's prehistoric past and actual artifacts used between 7,000 and 8,000 years ago. More information at brevardmuseum.org. Welcome to Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle, and we're here at a lusty battlefield historic state park to discuss the Civil War in Florida. The loud booming of cannon fire rips through the North Florida pine forest 15 miles east of Lake City as startled cavalry horses whinny. Repeated rifle fire rings through the trees as more than 10,000 soldiers confront each other on February 20th, 1864, near Ocean Pond. While there was some gunfire exchanged in other parts of the state, the Battle of Alusty was the largest conflict of the American Civil War fought on Florida soil. Each side began with about 5,000 troops. When the three-hour battle was over, nearly 3,000 soldiers were dead, two-thirds of them from the Union forces. Three new U.S. Colored Troop regiments bravely fought as Union soldiers at the Battle of Alusty, some even before they had an opportunity to complete their training. An annual reenactment of the bloody fight is held at the Alusty Battlefield Historic State Park. Alusty is important for uh, a number of political reasons. Um, it is significant because it comes at a time when the United States is attempting to swing southern states back into the Union. Um, and uh, there was an attempt, for example, to reconstruct Louisiana in 1863. Uh, the notion is that you're going to also then swing Florida into the Union. So uh, this is after also the Emancipation Proclamation had made it possible for African-American soldiers to serve. And so the combination of those factors, the presence of black soldiers, but also the idea of reconstructing Florida, uh, create the impetus for this campaign to secure Florida. Uh, it comes out of um, the east going towards the west and it kind of the confederate and union forces meet right here at Alusty. Um, and so the significance of this battle is that what it does is it, it means that Florida is not going to be one of those kind of early states um, to be reconstructed. And the presence of black soldiers is significant not only in its meaning for African-American citizenship but also in the unfortunate events that occurred at the end of the battle when many wounded black soldiers were summarily executed by confederate troops. The Union lost the Battle of Alusty, but won the Civil War 14 months later. Florida was the third state to secede from the Union in January 1861, behind only South Carolina and Mississippi. Florida was the primary supplier of beef to the Confederate Army. Florida was very significant um, to the Confederate war effort in that it supplied uh, beef, it supplied salt. Um, it was an area where uh, supplies could come in. Um, uh, you know, the, the United States sets up a blockade of the Confederate coast, but of course Florida has a massive coast. There's no way that, that those Union ships um, are going to be able to keep all uh, activity away from Florida. Um, now the one thing that's interesting and significant about Florida is that it had no rail connection with the South in the beginning of the war. Um, and so there's an internal struggle within Florida to set up a kind of rail connection. Um, railroads were in many ways the, the lifelines uh, for Civil War armies. 
Um, and so uh, without that lifeline, uh, Florida's impact on the Confederate ar Army could be limited. And so that's why that was uh, in many ways so contested. And that's why control over the state was so contested because the Confederacy was trying to run a war on, frankly, limited resources. And uh, Florida beef and Florida salt uh, were really, really significant parts of that kind of logistical aspect of the war. The Olusti Battlefield Historic Site is Florida's first state park established in 1909. Since 1977, an annual reenactment of the Battle of Olusti has been staged here. Authentic Union and Confederate camps are part of the reenactment weekend, with groups of people in Civil War era costumes sitting around campfires among hundreds of small canvas tents. Food vendors are on hand nearby, along with informational displays and people selling Civil War memorabilia. A variety of public programs addressing various Civil War topics are presented, along with performances of period music. Joel Fears is a longtime participant in the Battle of Alusty annual reenactment weekend. Fears says he had graduated from college and was nearly an old man when he first discovered that African Americans were not just slaves, but actually fought and died in the Civil War. He wants to share this information with the public. Fears is dressed as a particular African American Union soldier. I'm representing James Henry Gooding. He was one of the people who fought here. Again, they were all educated. He was uh, uh, also, he wrote uh, dispatches to the New Bedford Mercury newspaper. And uh, he also was writing a story of this battle. So he was a writer, well educated, but he was captured here in this battle. He was wounded, he was taken to Andersonville, he was in prison there, and later on died there. If you go to Andersonville, to that historic site, you will see a grave marker there with his name on it. Mitch Morgan has been participating in the Battle of Alusty reenactment for nearly two decades, portraying a Confederate soldier. The event has special meaning for Morgan. Well, my uh, great-great-grandfather died on the battlefield here, and it was, I came out here for many years. I've been out here about 18 years now, and for the first 10 years or so, I didn't know that until I got interested in my genealogy and family history, and I'd always got kind of one of those feelings here, that there was something more to this than just being in Florida's biggest battle, and I'm, I'm a native Floridian, but I said, something more going on. I found out through my research that my great-great-grandfather died right here. He was the first unit to step on the field the day of the battle and perished. And I don't know where he's buried, possibly right where we're standing somewhere because they're buried all over the, the area here. So it's real personal for me now, even more so because of having an ancestor here. While the thousands of people who participate in the annual Battle of Alusty reenactment do so on a voluntary basis, not all of the soldiers who took part in the actual battle were so fortunate. The Confederacy is actually the first in, 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 among the Union of the Confederacy to set up conscription. Um, they do so pretty early. Uh, there's an initial wave of volunteerism, but then uh, as the Confederacy runs, runs low on potential troops, um, they enact a draft, they enact a conscription. And of course, the most controversial part uh, of that draft was the idea that you could buy a substitute. Um, which many people considered unpatriotic, but uh, the idea was that you could, if you got drafted, you could basically pay someone to serve in your stead. Um, and so. Some historians, it's a little bit contested, but some historians have argued that actually um, the bulk of this war and the bulk of the armies in both the Union and the Confederacy were, were willing to fight, that, that conscription is an important, uh, certainly important political point, but that conscripted soldiers tended to, to not dominate either um, rank, uh, either the ranks of, of, of the Union or the Confederate armies. The Battle of Alusty Citizen Support Organization is the not-for-profit group that presents the annual reenactment. Event organizers believe that it is important for us to remember this difficult period in our history and that the Battle of Alusty reenactment helps us to do that. This was a significant battle for the state of Florida. Uh, the Union was going to come in and eventually go all the way over to Tallahassee, capture the, the capital. Didn't happen. In fact, after the Battle of Alusty, they went and stayed pretty much on the coast. They didn't venture back in again. Um, we learn from our history. We'd never want anything like this to ever happen again. But it's good to explore the history of what did happen 
from battle tactics to the humanities. What happened to the citizens? What happened to the farmers and ranchers that were in the area? So it's as much about remembrance as understanding our history and how this great country was formed. Even under conflict, we see lasting relationships that have endured over the years. We can see that even as the veterans of this conflict actually came together with reunions after the battle to show that we had reunited as a country. At 4 a.m. on April 1, 1864, an explosion disrupted the still waters of the St. Johns River as a Confederate mine ripped through the hull of the steamship Maple Leaf. The boat was transporting Union supplies. It was participating in the Southeast Atlantic blockade as a troop transport. And after the Battle of Old Lusty, which was a major defeat, all troops were called from surrounding areas, especially Charleston, to come to Jacksonville immediately. They had camped on Folly Island, an entire brigade, for about 20 months. And so it took the quartermasters approximately a month to break down that entire camp, load up all the thousands of soldiers, personal effects into boxes. They were all placed into the Maple Leaf. Before the Union supplies could be unloaded from the Maple Leaf, the ship was ordered to go to Palatka and deposit some provisions there, including a group of horses. The ship never made it back to Jacksonville. They were ordered to travel at night with no lights. Only the binnacle light was allowed in the captain's um, and the pilot's house. It was a full moon, no wind, the river was as clear as the surface of a mirror, and Romeo Murray, the pilot, was heading north. He, he saw nothing on the water, but there was an explosive contact, explosive mine submerged under the water. He struck that directly under the hull, approximately at the foremast, and it imploded a huge hole into the bow of the boat. The front deck of the Maple Leaf caved in and the pilot house fell forward. The ship's whistle started to blow as its wire was stretched. The pilot turned the boat in an attempt to get to the east bank of the river, but it was too late. After five or six revolutions of the paddle wheel, the Maple Leaf sank to the bottom of the St. Johns River. The Confederate mine that sunk the Maple Leaf was about a yard wide. The center looked like a small barrel, but tapered wooden points on both sides made it resemble a torpedo. The mine blast killed four people, but the rest of the crew was able to escape in lifeboats. When it touched bottom, there was about two to three feet on the upper cabins of water, and the rest of it was above the water. All of the people on board, four people were killed. They were firemen, they were in the forecastle, which is the very front of the ship where the explosion occurred. Everybody was able to get in their life rafts and um, the officer in charge said he thought it would be the better part of valor to get out of there before the Confederates approached. And then they spent that rest of the evening from four o'clock in the morning rowing to Jacksonville and arrived there about 8.30 in the morning. Today, we view the materials left aboard the Maple Leaf as having great cultural significance, but the artifacts remained undisturbed for more than 125 years. In 1984, Jacksonville dentist and diving enthusiast Keith Holland became aware of the Maple Leaf story and formed St. John's Archaeological Excavations Incorporated to research, locate, and excavate the ship. Years of research led Holland to the conclusion that 800,000 pounds of personal items belonging to Union soldiers would still be aboard the Maple Leaf, preserved in an anaerobic environment. I had a general idea of where it was. Eventually, I bought a boat-towed pulse metal detector, and in dragging that, it caught onto something. My uh, brother-in-law, who was a scuba diver, um, dove down to untangle it, and sure enough, it was on a shrimp net that was attached to some huge metal items. We both went down and analyzed it and determined that that was, in all probability, the paddle wheel axle of the ship. It was the only thing really sticking up above the mud. 
And then I was elated to know that in fact I did find maple leaf, but at the same time I had a very depressing feeling because I realized she was beyond my reach. She, the main deck was buried under seven feet of St. John's River mud. This was going to take a very big deal to get to. Holland's team was able to clear away enough mud to gain access to the ship and begin recovering artifacts from the maple leaf. Much of that material is on display at the Mandarin Museum and Historical Society in Jacksonville, along with a detailed model of the ship, a replica of the mine that sank it, and a diving suit worn by one of the excavators. It was a hugely important event in our country's history, and that uh, Florida was not exempt from that. Many people think nothing happened in Florida that had anything to do with the Civil War, so it gives us an opportunity to educate people about the involvement that was here in this area that they may live in or that they're visiting. Um, but I think that the main thing is the cultural impact, you know, I mean, looking at how people lived. What was it like to be a soldier? Um, what, was, uh, what was it, what kinds of instruments did they use to write home? You know, they didn't uh, text somebody and say, I arrived safely to Jacksonville. Uh, you know, they had to write letters with a a pen and a, an ink bottle. And so it opens up a period of time that many people don't have much awareness of. We do a lot of school tours here, and it's really um, fun to have the children come and try to think about what it would be like to live in that time period and to, to have the kinds of um, challenges that the people had during this time. Only a very small portion of the Maple Leaf cargo has been recovered most of the ship's contents remains buried in the St. John's River. The immense collection of artifacts from Florida's Civil War past is preserved for future generations to discover. Welcome to the roundtable portion of Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle, and joining us is Ben DiBiase, Director of Educational Resources for the Florida Historical Society and Archivist at the Library of Florida History in Cocoa. Welcome, Ben. Thanks for having us, Ben. Jesus Mendez is Associate Professor of History at Barry University in Miami Shores, and Florida history is among his areas of expertise. Welcome, Glad Jesus. to be here. N.Y. Nathiri is Director of Multidisciplinary Programs for the Association to Preserve the Eatonville Community and Founding Director of the Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities. Welcome, Mrs. Nathiri. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Ben, I, I want to start with you. We, we just saw descriptions of the Battle of Alesti and the sinking of the Maple Leaf. What are some of the other ways that the Civil War had a direct impact on Floridians? Well, as you mentioned, the Battle of Alesti uh, was the largest pitched battle between the Union and Confederate armies that occurred within the boundaries of Florida. Uh, but Florida was important for a number of other reasons, uh, not necessarily just in its uh, military, uh, the military involvement, um, but Florida, at least uh, throughout the, uh, towards the end of the war, Florida became an important resource for uh, both beef and salt. Uh, which were two products that the Confederate armies and navies uh, sorely needed. Uh, now, as the war progressed and the Confederacy began to uh, slowly lose many of the larger battles um, and other campaigns, Florida again became more and more important as a resource for these materials. Now, as a response, the Union Navy decided to set up a, uh, a military blockade around the coastline. This blockade uh, stretched most of the eastern seaboard uh, south along Florida's uh, uh, southwest uh, coast all the way up through the Gulf. And the goal was to choke off Florida as a means of that production center. Uh, there were a number of supplies coming from the Bahamas, from uh, Cuba, uh, and these supplies were then being uh, brought up through Florida into the Confederate States, uh, and the Union navies uh, fought very hard to combat that. Uh, so there were a number of naval skirmishes and battles. There were uh, forays into the interior that were conducted by the Union armies and navies in order to stop that production. Uh, but there were a number of other small uh, army battles that took place. One would be the Battle of Natural Bridge, 
uh, which occurred just south of uh, Tallahassee, and, and it was strategically important uh, because it protected the capital, which was Tallahassee, towards the end of the war. Uh, again, there were other naval skirmishes, the Battle of Tampa, uh, and the Battle of Gainesville as well. So uh, even though uh, many scholars, for years at least, have diminished the role that Florida played uh, in the larger conflict, uh, Florida was both strategically important, uh, not only for its uh, uh, provisions, but also for uh, troops. Florida raised a number of troops, uh, and actually per capita, the state of Florida produced more troops than any other Confederate state. They, many of these troops would go on to fight outside of, of Florida's borders, but they were uh, important nonetheless. Well, Dr. Mendez, one of the lingering arguments remaining from the Civil War is what exactly the, the war was all about. Some people argue that the primary argument, the primary issue was states' rights versus federal rights while the other perspective is that the war, of course, was being fought over slavery. Can we resolve this issue today? Uh, not really. One of the things that one can learn from history is that there never is a clear-cut single answer to any issue. And because if there was, then we would have one-page books on history, <laughs> and that would make for very boring history. Um, so you do have that in the Civil War for Florida, the state's rights issue and the slavery issue were both present, but what is interesting is that they were both intertwined. You have that at the beginning of our country's history in the Constitutional Convention, both issues were addressed. Uh, for the issue of state rights, of course, we have the great compromise of the House of Representatives and the Senate, where you have that the larger states get disproportionately more power in the House of Representatives, but there's equal power in the Senate. And for the issue of slavery, of course, we have that in our Constitution, although no longer in force, we have the famous three-fifth clause, where African Americans are to be counted as three-fifths of a citizen. Um, now, you have that there was the Missouri Compromise of 1820 that did not allow for slavery above the 36-30 longitude line, uh, with the exception, of course, of Missouri. And that was, as the name says, a compromise. And then you have, in the 1850s, the famous Kansas-Nebraska Act, where you have that another attempt at compromise was made, but this time in favor of the southern states for uh, allowing slavery to be introduced by popular sovereignty. And this swung the pendulum in favor of the South and led to increasing tensions. So you do have that when the Civil War does break out in 1861, both issues were present, the state's right, but in particular, the issue of slavery. So both sides are correct in arguing for one or for the other, but of course, what the Civil War and its outcome eventually determined is that states' rights were not absolute because as Lincoln said, he wanted to preserve the Union so the states lost the right of secession. And once you have a break in the dam, you have that national will can oftentimes determine the fate of the entire nation and not just within the borders of a single state. Hmm. Well, Mrs. Nathiri, Eatonville, Florida is the oldest incorporated African-American municipality in the United States, established in 1887, and other historic black communities were also created in the decades following the Civil War. The modern civil rights movement has largely been about integration, but in the years after the Civil War, creating self-sustained black communities seemed to be the goal. Indeed, and that really is an outcome of the, of the failure of the Reconstruction era in terms of the ability to protect the uh, safety of the uh, newly uh, freed um, um, former enslaved. What you had with the, um, the assassination of President Lincoln was a Reconstruction era that really was not in keeping with his, with his vision. And what that meant essentially was with the election of 1876 and the, uh, and the political uh, deal that brought Rutherford B. Hayes into the presidency, you had the removal of the federal troops 
who were the guarantor of the safety of the African American population. And so literally uh, during that Reconstruction era, there was a reign of terror against the, um, against the African American population. Hence, the thinking amongst visionaries in that group was that you needed to establish communities where you could govern yourselves, where you could protect yourselves. And with the establishment of Eatonville in 1887, you have the culmination or the fruition of that vision. Interesting. Now, uh, why is the Civil War relevant to contemporary people today? Uh, Jesus, your students uh, must uh, ask you that. What, what, what is the relevance today? One of the things that makes, in my opinion, America great is the spirit of political compromise. But then on the other hand, you have moral issues that of course cannot be compromised. And the key question is how do we resolve that? And of course the resolution has to be by discussion and more importantly by being honest with one another. And always in my mind keeping the nation's uh, well-being in mind and not your own narrow self-interest. Thank you. Thanks to our roundtable panelists, Ben DiBiase from the Florida Historical Society, Jesus Mendez from Barry University, and N.Y. Nathiri from the Association to Preserve the Eatonville Community. You've been watching Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Brokemarkle.